Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to lecture number 8 of the subject business law Today's topic of discussion is contract of agency. I am Dr. Rama Bansal working as assistant professor at Arya College Ludhiana. This project is sponsored by DTH Swayam Prabha MHRD New Delhi. So under the contract of agency we are going to cover test of agency, definition of agent and principal, kinds of agents, creation of agency agents duty to principal rights of an agent agents liability to third party rights of principal and at last the termination of agency first of all it is important to know what is agency or more important to know why agency is needed as we all know today's modern business is becoming so complex so it is not possible for an individual to carry all the affairs of the business alone he needs someone's help and that someone creates the need of the agency so let's read what is the agency an agency relationship is established when one party that is agent is authorized by another party that is principal to act on his or her behalf the person who does anything for return is known as agent and the person to whom the agent does anything is known as principal that means in the complex word uh, when one person takes help of the another person when one person appoints other person to uh, to work at his place to work on his or her behalf that person who is appointed is known as agent and the person who appoints him or her is called as principal ancient law of contract also defines agency as although as a general rule one man cannot by contract with another confer rights or to impose liabilities upon a third party yet he may represent another as being employed by him for the purpose of bringing him to legal relation with a third party so employment for this purpose is called as agency there is a legal uh, maxim i have written so which means the person who acts an act uh, who does an act through another is deemed in law to do it himself this maxim clearly shows that any act done by another person would be deemed as it is done by himself the agency may be express or the implied so agent may be expressly or impliedly authorized to do an act on behalf of the principal let's see the example if i authorize my agent to sell my house to a third person and if he does so i become bound for the sale of the house to the third party in the same way as i myself contracted to sell the house that means the the agent can bound the principal in the same manner as the activity or the transaction is being done by the principal himself so in the contract of agency always there are two parties one is the principal second one is the agent the person who authorizes the another person to work on his or her behalf is called as principal and to whom the principal appoints the principal authorizes to work on his or her behalf is called as an agent features of relationship of agency there must be a few features so that we can called it as a contract of agency one there must be an agreement between the principal and the agent next intention of agent to act on the behalf of principal this should not be by compulsion there must be an intention on the part of the agent who would be willing to work on the behalf of the principal the authority conferred should be such as will make the principal answerable to third parties that means 
any act done by the agent will make the principal bound to perform that the object of the appointment must be to establish the relationship between principal and third parties that means the objective of this appointment the objective of the uh, of the contract of agency must be so that there can be a relationship between the principal and the third party and this relationship is to be established with the help of agent the relationship of agency being based on confidence between the principal and agent no consideration is necessary so all these are the features of a contract of agency whose presence make it as a valid contract when we want to know whether this is a contract of agency or not there are few questions which are to be answered and if the answer to these questions is yes then this uh, must be treated as the contract of agency so among the questions the first question is whether the person has the capacity to bind the principal and make him answerable to third parties that means if a person has the capacity to bind another to make him responsible for the third parties towards the third parties that means if the person has capacity and the answer is yes then this is a contract of agency second whether he can create legal relationship relations between principals and the third parties here legal relations means whether the contract between the principal and the third parties would be enforceable at law or not and if the answers to this question is again yes that means this is a contract of agency so in in concluding it we can say if one person has the capacity to bind the other towards the third parties and the contract created between the principal and the third parties is enforceable at law that means it is a valid contract of agency there is a case proving this the case is of loon karan versus john and company the facts of the case were it was held an agent never acts on his be, his own behalf but he always acts on behalf of another he either represents his principal in any transactions or dealings with a third person or performs an act for the principal so the facts of the case the decision of the case clearly shows that upon ask two questions must be tested before creating the before uh, validating the contract of agency now as we have read there are two parties to the contract of agency one is the agent another one is the principal now what is a valid definition of an agent every person who acts for another is not an agent he can never he can never always be uh, Uh, designated as an agent to the principal a person does not become an agent only if he works on another's behalf because he gives him advice it's it's not only the case section 182 explains that to be an agent the person employed must be authorized to do any act for another or to represent another in dealing with third parties that means a person who can make who can represent the principal to the third parties that person can be an agent and yes it is very important to know here that a minor person can also be employed as an agent we know that a contract with minor is a void ab initio but here in that case because agent is working on the behalf of the principal and for all the transactions made by the agent the principal is going to be responsible so that's why a minor can be employed as an agent there is a case harbans lal kapoor versus messer produce exchange corporation limited let's see the facts of the case The question arose whether Harbans Lal Kapoor was an accounting party or not. The branch office transacted a business worth about a lakh of rupees every year. Kapoor was employed as an accountant by the plaintiff company and his duty was to maintain the accounts. 
it was held that the courts below were right in observing that Kapoor was the accounting party here. So, the appeal fails and is dismissed with the costs. Next, we come to what is the definition of the principle. Section 183 clearly states that a person who is the age of majority and is of sound mind can become a principal. That means one of the feature of the of being a principal is that the person must have the capacity to enter into a contract which we have already studied in detail. That means a person should be of, uh, of uh, age of majority. He should be of a sound mind to become a principal. Next case, a minor cannot act as principal. Because a contract with minor is always void ab initio. So, a minor cannot be act as principal reason being if any anything done by any transaction done by agent will make the bound principal. So, if the minor would be the principal, he cannot be enforced. So, the contract would become void. So, in that case, a minor cannot act as principal. This is also clear in the case of Mahendra Pratap Singh versus Padam Kumar Devi. The facts of the case are a client gave power of attorney to his counsel when client was of sound mind. Subsequently, he became old, feeble, weak, unable to comprehend due to mental incapacity. It was held that the power of attorney had become worthless after the change in the state of health and mental infirmity of client. That means a person who don't have the capacity to enter into a contract cannot be treated as principal. Next, considerations in agency contracts. So, we normally say there must be some consideration in any contract to make it valid. So, let's see what is the role of consideration in the agency contracts. Section 185 lays down that no consideration is necessary to create an agency. The acceptance of the office of an agent is regarded as a sufficient consideration for the appointment of the agent by the principal. Let's see the example. A authorizes his friend B who has knowledge of automobiles to buy a motor car for him. B accepts the responsibility. Here a valid contract of agency is created though no consideration is involved in the contract. A has not paid anything to B to purchase a motor car for him. But B has accepted the responsibility of an agent and he is willingly, he, he has the intention to perform that task. That means even in absence of consideration, the contract between the principal and agent is a valid contract. Fiduciary position of agent. In agency, there is an important thing to learn about the position of the agent, the fiduciary position of the agent, what it means. The position of the agent is the position of the principal. That means as we know because agent is working on the behalf of the principal. That means when agent makes any kind of transaction, we will say this transaction is being done by the principal. And in view of the fiduciary relationship, agent cannot be permitted to claim his own possession. So, there is a case David Level versus John Lawson Kendry. The facts of the case were the agent was collecting the rent from the tenants on the behalf of the principal and depositing it in a separate earmarked account. He continued to do so even after the death of the owner. After 12 years, his heirs Assignee brought an action against the agent. The defendant pleaded adverse possession and limitation and the, uh, in the result of the case, the plaintiff succeeded. Now, till now, we have learned about what is the meaning of agency, what are the definitions of uh, agent and principal, who can be a principal, who can be an agent, what is the role of consideration and what do we mean by the fiduciary relationship. Now we come to the next topic under the uh, contract of agency that is the kinds of agent. What are the various kinds of agents we have? One is the express or implied agents. As in case of other valid contracts, 
there is a express or implied uh, type of agents when any principal appoints someone as uh, someone in words for work uh, to work from him that is a express agent uh, agency created expressly but when someone works on the behalf of the other on the uh, or for the other that is called as an implied agent next general special or universal agents general agent is employed to transact generally all the business of the principal in regard which in which he is employed means a particular business he will transact all the all the transactions of the business of a particular type in which for which he is being employed special agent has only authority to do some particular act or to represent the principal only in some particular situations but if we talk about the universal agent universal agent is authorized to transact all the business of the principal of every kind the difference between the general agent and the universal agent is that general agent will also transact all the business of the principal but for the business in which he is being appointed but in case of universal agent the person is authorized to transact all the business of the principal of every kind next agent or sub agent there is a person who is being appointed by the principal as his agent the person is agent but when for his or her help agent further appoints someone that is called as sub agent next categorization of the uh, kinds of agents is a mercantile or non mercantile agents so let's see the first mercantile agent among the mercantile agents the first one is the factor who is the factor to whom possession of goods is given for sale means factor is a person to whom goods are being given so that he can sell the goods and goods are consigned by a merchant who is residing abroad or at some distant place factor generally sells the goods in his own name and the main important thing to learn here that factor cannot barter or pledge the goods he only have a right of lien for the balance of amount which he can exercise in case of default at the part of the principal next mercantile agent is the auctioneer who is the auctioneer auctioneer is the person who sells the goods through the auction and it is being appointed uh, it is being appointed by the seller or may be appointed by the buyer and the auctioneer may or may not be interested with the possession possession or the goods may be in his control or may not be in his control he can sue the purchase price in his own name second kind of agent is the auctioneer who is an auctioneer auctioneer may be appointed by the seller or the buyer to sell the goods through the auction he is appointed to sell the goods at a public auction and for that he is being the, he is being paid the remuneration and it is not necessary that goods must be in his possession goods must be in his control it is not necessary he may or may not be interested with the possession or control of the goods but yes he can sue the purchase price in his own name next mercantile agent is the broker who is a broker broker is employed to make contracts for purchase and sale of the goods and for doing this purchase and sale of goods he is being paid commission which is called as brokerage and doc, uh, all the documents are title are not made over to him they are with the buyer or they are with the seller his only duty is to bring the parties that means buyer and seller together and to bargain he makes contract in the name of the 
principal he works as an agent for the principal he is only a negotiator or we can call him that he is only a middleman that means broker is a person who brings the parties together to to bargain further and the purpose of this is to purchase and sale of goods and for this he gets a commission certain commission and that commission in legal language is called as brokerage next is a commission agent commission agent is a person who in consideration of certain commission engages to purchase or sale of goods for his principal he buys and sells goods in the market on the best term in his own name this is a differentiation between the broker and the commission agent his only interest in the whole purchase and sale of good is the commission and all the profits and losses of a particular transaction would belong to the principal and it is also again not necessary that he must be in the possession of goods goods may be in his possession or goods may not be in his possession but what the sale and uh, purchase is being done in the market it would be done on the best term and by using his own name next mercantile agent is the banker banker is an agent who buys or sells the securities he collects the checks on the behalf of the principal he also gives the dividend he also pays the bills on the behalf of his customers means when bank provide these services to his uh, customers that means at that time bank is leading a role of an agent for the principal next is del creditor agent del creditor uh, del creditor agent is an agent who in consideration of an extra remuneration grants to his principal the performance of the contract by the other party uh, normally the del creditor commission is always higher than the uh, normal commission this is a reward for him and when he he makes the contract he occupies the position of a grantor as well as of a agent because he is giving the guarantee of the performance of the contract but it is uh, necessary to mention here that his liability is secondary only when when the principal is not performing and he is being appointed when principal deals with the person about him about whom he knows nothing means he is he, he knows nothing about the persons and to facilitate this transaction an agent is being appointed to whom a more reward a, a normal a extra commission is being paid than the normal commission which is called as a del creditor commission and his liability becomes secondary after the liability of principal there is a case regarding this the case is of champran versus tulsi lal jail uh, tulsi ram jailal uh, the facts of the case decided were del creditor agent's legal position is partly that of an insurer and partly that of a surety for the parties with whom he deals to the extent of any default by reason of any insolvency or something equivalent next category of the agent is the general agent and the particular agent if any person is being appointed as an agent for all the specific or, or for all the transactions of a business he is the general agent but when the agent is being appointed for a particular transaction the person is known as a particular agent this second category of the agents was the non mercantile agents till now what we have discussed regarding the commission agent broker broker del creditor uh, agent all these were the mercantile agents second category was the non mercantile agents who are the non mercantile agents the non mercantile agents include counsel solicitor guardian promoter wife receiver insurance agent etc so now till now we have discussed the various types of agencies now let's discuss how the uh, contract of agency is being created what is the process of creation of the agency so the first step in this is agency by express agreement when either by words spoken or some written words a contract is being created this is called as agency by express 
agreement and in case of express agreement there are no form no no set words when a person gives a power of attorney to the another person this is also an example of the express agency that means when one person by either by words spoken or by some written words gives the rights to work on his or her behalf that is the agency by express agreement second is agency by implication when uh, there is a clear clear indication by the behavior that means this is a agency by implication we can read from here also authority to act it is the authority to act as an agent inferred from nature of business circumstances of the case conduct of the business of the principal or the course of dealing between the parties these are the factors which determine that this is an agency by implication basically it depends upon the nature of the business or the conduct of the principal there is a case regarding this ishq versus madanlal so in this case what happened plaintiff a wholesale dealer of potatoes at fatehgarh in up sold and dispatched potato to the defendant a dealer of potatoes in madhya pradesh the defendant refused to take the delivery of goods the plaintiff sent his agent to him to sell them at any price he chooses the agent contacted the defendant again the offer made by defendant for the consignment was the highest but this amounts was rupees 700 less what the defendant was ready to pay agent accepted the payment in full settlement the plaintiff brought an action to recover the amount of 700 from the defendant and the court in this case said that agent has an implied authority to accept smaller amount of cash and plaintiff's action failed when we talk about the uh, implied agency it further includes agency by estoppel what is agency by estoppel when a person conferring any authority by his conduct leads a third party to believe that that the certain person is an agent of a particular person and he subsequently estopped from denying the fact of agency this is called as agency by estoppel lord hillsbury hillsbury has explained estoppel arises when you are precluded from denying the truth of anything which you have represented as a fact although it is not a fact it would be clear more from the example x tells y in the presence of z that x is z's agent z doesn't contradict this statement if y enters into a contract with x thinking him to be z's agent the z is bound by the contract because he didn't contradict the statement at that time when x tells that he is z's agent that means if any person confers any authority by his conduct that means this is the case of agency by estoppel second under this is agency by holding out when a person permits the others by a long course of conduct to pledge his credit for certain purpose that means he is bound by the act of the person in pledging his credit for the similar purposes or similar type of transactions even in the future this is clear by the example where a husband hold out his wife as having his authority by words or by conduct and a third party advances money to his wife on the faith of such conduct the husband is liable for such debts similar we can understood by the case of hazard versus trade wells what happened in this case a dealer in iron sent his service servant to buy on credit and paid for it next time he again sent the same servant to buy iron but this time servant also purchased the iron on credit instead of cash on the basis of the previous transaction iron merchant assumed that he is a agent of uh, of the uh, of a of of dealer and hence dealer was held liable to pay the price for the iron purchased on credit this time too third under the implied agency is agency by necessity uh, 
This agency uh, arises in case of any extraordinary circumstances. A person may not be the real agent of the person, but in case of some extraordinary circumstances, this type of agency comes into the existence. So, in the agency by necessity, there is no express or implied authority to do an act is required. This is clear from the case of GN Railway Company versus Swearfield. The horse was consigned to the defendant at a certain railway station, but no one took the delivery of the horse at the destination point. So, the station master had to feed the horse for the meanwhile. So, it was held that the railway company was the agent by necessity and the defendant was liable to pay the feeding charges of the horse. Means, if we say agency uh, by implication includes agency by necessity and agency by necessity, agency by estoppel, agency by holding out. All these three type of agencies are the part of the implied agency means agency by implication. Next is third type of agency is agency by ratification. If any act of the agent is being ratified by the principal later on, this is called as agency by ratification. That means if agent has performed any act beyond the authority, normally these type of acts are not binding upon the principal. But if principal adopts this act of the agent and this is called as the ratification of the act done by the agent. On ratification, act of agent becomes the act of the principal and immediately the principal becomes bound by the same. Principal has to own the things done by the agent. In short, if any act is being done, which was not in the authority of the agent and even though he has performed that act and the principal has later on ratified it, he has owned it. That means he would be liable for the acts done by the uh, agent. Ratification is an approval of the previous act done by the agent by the principal. So, there is an example clearing this agency by ratification. P without having any authority of Q's, Q acts as Q's agent and enters into a contract with R. The contract will be binding on Q if he ratifies or approves of the same. So, uh, when we talk about the agency by ratification, there should be some essentials of that valid ratification. First one is act must have done on behalf of person ratifying. A person can ratify only those acts which have been done by him and which cannot be ratified which is done by someone else. If the agent acts in his own name and makes no mention to agency, this act cannot be ratified. That means the acts must have been done on the behalf of the person ratifying, not on the name of the agent. Second is, the principal must be in existence at the time of act that is to be ratified. If the principal does not exist at the time when the contract was made, then this type of ratification is not possible. The act cannot be ratified. See the example, a company cannot ratify or adopt a contract which was entered into by the promoter on its behalf before its incorporation. If the contract is being done with the company and uh, the contract is done uh, by the promoters, but before the incorporation of the company, because here the party is, uh, the company is one of the party and party uh, and that party, that company does not exist on the date of the contract. So, this is not a valid, uh, valid ratification. Ratifier should be competent to ratify the act. We know. Any person who don't have the contractual capacity cannot ratify the contract. Contractual capacity means the person should not be minor, the person should be of sound mind and the person should not be disqualified by the law. Next is the transaction must have subsisting at the time when it is ratified. 
that means the approval of the transaction must occur before the other party has withdrawn from it and before the agreement has been terminated to make it more clear let's see the example a enters into a contract with b representing himself as the agent of c without c's authority but before c ratifies it d resigns the contract so here c cannot ratified it after such rescission that means when one party had withdrawn uh, withdrawn from it and the agreement has been terminated it cannot be ratified next is the principal must have signified his unconditional acceptance of the act that means when principal is going to ratify the act of the act done by the agent there must be unconditional acceptance unconditional acceptance means there should not be any condition attached with the process of ratification ratification may be express or implied let's see the example mr a without authority buys goods for mr b afterwards mr b sells them to mr c on his own account b's conduct clearly shows that there is a implied ratification of the purchase made by him uh, for mr a next is ratification must have been made with full knowledge of the material facts that means when the ratification is done by the principal he should know each and every material fact of the transaction for which he is going to make the ratification let's see the example mr a directed his agent mr b to purchase grain for him but mr b sold his own grain to mr a at a price higher than the market price so later on mr a ratified the purchase not knowing that the grain which he has purchased belonged to mr b and the price was higher than the market price so in this case if we come to know about the case later on this ratification was held invalid this is not a valid ratification whole transaction must be ratified a part of transaction ratification is not possible ratification must be made within a reasonable time reasonable time we 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 normally say uh, let's take the example according to limitation act there is a reasonable time of uh, of ratification for any transaction regarding the uh, money the the time period is the the reasonable time is the 3 months that means if like this there are other transactions for which there uh, there is a limit of the time the limit of time is known as the reasonable time here so the ratification must be made within that reasonable time next act to be ratified should not be void or illegal means any type of act which is being ratified initially it should not be a void or illegal act let's see the example a forgery of signatures being a crime cannot be ratified means if agent has done the forgery of signatures somewhere and later on principal wants to ratify this act this is not a valid ratification reason being it is not a valid contract ratification must be communicated if the principal has made the ratification for the act of the agent the principal it is a duty of the principal to communicate that ratification to the agent too ratification must not injure a third person that means this act of principal of the ratification should not give any kind of injury to the third person let's see the example mr a not being authorized there to by mr b demands on behalf of mr b the delivery of a chattel the property of mr b from mr c who is in the possession of it so this demand cannot be ratified by mr b so as to make c liable for damage for his refusal to deliver so this is how the ratification is being done and we have done regarding what are the ways of creation of the agency now as we discuss there are two parties agents and principal so they must be liable for liable to each other they must have authority against the each other so let's first discuss the agents duties towards the principal 
the first duty of the agent is duty to act according to principal's direction section 211 clearly say that the agent has the duty towards the principal to work according to the principal's directions if in case agent has not worked according to the directions of the principal he would be liable for any loss occurred to the principal because of that transaction he is but at the same time he is not liable to obey the unlawful instructions of the principal let's see the example there was an auction without reserve of a horse without reserve price of a house horse but the owner of the horse had secretly given reserve price to the auctioneer which was later disregarded he sold the horse at a price which was less than the price communicated by the owner to the auctioneer it was held that the auctioneer was not liable and he was not bound to obey the unlawful instructions of the owner means where the agent has the duty to work according to the directions of the principal at the same time he is not liable to work according to unlawful instructions of the principal second uh, under this is duty to act with reasonable skill and diligence according to section 212 this section clearly uh, makes it ki when the person who is a agent going to perform any transaction he should work with the skill and it is generally uh, the the skill which here is talked about is generally possessed by the person engaged in the similar business he is Uh, bound to make compensation in case of his neglect in case of not using the reasonable skill and diligence while working for the principal so the standard of skill basically depends upon the nat nature of the profession let's take the example if a stock broker is working for some uh, is is working as an agent he must know the regulations of the stock exchange while dealing in the stocks that means in case of business any agent is to make the is uh, is able to use the skill and diligence while do, while performing for the principal let's see the case of capel versus wheeler the principal instructed an agent estate agent to find a buyer for his estate so this buyer was found who was willing to pay rupees 6150 rupees only before sale agent got an uh, before sale agent got an offer for rupees 6750 from another buyer which was the higher amount than the previous one so the agent did not communicated about this offer to the principal that means he has not used his skill and diligence which cause a loss to the principal so for this loss the agent would be responsible the third point is duty to render accounts according to section 213 an agent is responsible to render the accounts to the principal rendering of account doesn't only mean the showing of accounts it also must be supported by the vouchers agent is also responsible to principal if he has made any kind of secret profits out of the business of the agency and agent is also having the right to sue the principal for the rendition of accounts that means agent has the duty for the principal that he must render all the accounts of the agency to the principal with the vouchers and if any kind of secret profits is being made that must also be conveyed to the principal let's see the case narayan das versus papan mal when all the accounts are in the possession of the principal and agent does not possess his account to enable him to determine his claim against the principal for commission next point of the agent's duty to principal is duty to communicate in case of difficulty of using all the diligence and skill and in communicating with his principal and getting the instructions it is the duty of the agent to to uh, to work in the best interest of the principal in short if there is any problem any difficulty 
वेयर एजेंट कैन नॉट यूज हिज ओन स्किल्स एंड डिलीजेंस एंड ही मस्ट कम्युनिकेट टू द प्रिंसिपल बट इवन इफ इट इज नॉट पॉसिबल टू कम्युनिकेट विद द प्रिंसिपल इन दैट सिचुएशन सो द एजेंट मस्ट वर्क इन द बेस्ट इंटरेस्ट ऑफ द प्रिंसिपल नेक्स्ट इज ड्यूटी नॉट टू डील ऑन हिज ओन अकाउंट This is covered under section two hundred fifteen and two hundred sixteen. Uh, actually, agent cannot work without acquainting the principal with, uh, with all the material facts which are involved into his knowledge. Otherwise, if later on principal came to know all these facts, he may repudiate the transaction. Where the agent accepts any money in course of agency by the way of bribe. he must be liable to the principal to return all that kind of money that means he should bring this to the knowledge of the principal that he had made some kind of secret profits he should not deal on his own name he has to work by acquainting the principal with all the material facts of the agency next duty to pay overall monies Section two hundred eighteen explains the overall monies. He, uh, the agent, is bound to pay all money received on his account. However, he can deduct the lawful charges made by him to perform a particular task of the agency. Next point is duty not to use information obtained in the course of agency against a principal. Means if any case. Uh, the agent has any important information with him which can affect the principal which can uh, give any kind of loss to the principal he cannot use that information if he is doing so principal can restrain him from doing so by an injunction from the court next point is duty not to set up adverse title if agents is doing the things which uh, due to which he is setting the adverse title against the true owner against the principal then in that case principal can prohibit him from doing so that means an agent has a duty not to set up the adverse title against the principal next duty of the agent is duty not to delegate actually agent is to work on the behalf of the principal for the principal and according to section 190 of indian contract act uh, 1872 this duty agent cannot delegate with someone else means he cannot delegate his authority or he cannot employ another person to perform the act either expressly or impliedly but he can delegate the authority only to a sub agent that is only in the few cases these are the cases the first one is if the principal has expressly permitted such delegation means the agent wants to give some work to sub agent but the principal should know that that he has appointed some sub agent second whereby the ordinary custom of a trade or sub agent may be employed means it is a usual custom of the trade to appoint a sub agent in case of unforeseen emergencies means it was really an emergent situation in which the agent has to appoint the sub agent where the act to be done is purely ministerial and does not involve exercise of discretion or professional skills means except in these four cases a agent an agent cannot delegate his authority or cannot employ another person to perform the task given by the principal next duty of the agent is duty to protect and preserve the interest of the principal in case of his death or insolvency section 209 covers that in the case of death or insolvency of the principal it is a duty of the agent to protect and preserve the interest of the principal the where we have discussed the duties of an agent now we are going to discuss the rights of an agent first right of an agent is to right to remuneration section 219 and section 220 so in case of non gracious services agent is entitled to receive the agreed remuneration means the remuneration which was decided in a contract between the agent and the principal in case of non gracious services the agent has the right to receive that payment for the performance of any act is done 
not uh, not due to agent until the completion of such act that means uh, till the agent completes all the all the assigned task he may not demand for the payment of the performance this is being cleared in the case of sheik farid baksh versus hargun lal singh an agent was appointed to introduce a purchaser willing to purchase mr b's property he did introduce one and even the sale was settled the earnest money paid out but it could not be completed through the purchaser's inability to find money the agent was however held entitled to his agreed commission second right of an agent is right of retainer uh, agent can retain principal's money until his all claims in respect of the remuneration or in the, or in respect of advances made or in respect of any lawful expenses incurred by the agents are being paid he can also exercise the right of the lien if any kind of goods of the principal are under the custody of the agent third right of an agent is a right of lien under section 221 uh, agent is entitled to retain goods papers or any kind of property of the principal until all the amount due to him is being paid but yes he cannot sell that he only has the right of lien but he don't have the right to sell next right of agent is right to be indemnified against consequences of lawful acts under section 222 if in the uh, agency business the uh, agent has caused some some kind of losses so all these losses are to be indemnified by the principal to the agent but where the agent has incurred some kind of damages expenses in also in the defending action on behalf of the principal he is also entitled to for the, entitled for the reimbursement of all those damages and the expenses but if the contract is illegal it is important here to mention if the expenses are being done for the illegal uh, contract the claim of the agent cannot be enforced let's see the example mr b at singapore under instructions from mr a of calcutta contracts with mr c to deliver certain goods to him mr a does not send the goods to mr b and mr c sues mr b for the breach of contract mr b informs mr a of the suit and mr a authorizes him to defend the suit mr b is compelled to pay damages of the suit obviously and uh, here mr a is liable to pay for such damages and expenses to mr b next point is right to be indemnified against consequences of acts done in good faith section 223 the agent of the principal has the right to be indemnified against all the consequences of all the acts which he has performed in the good faith when the agent knows that the act was unlawful and even he works for that and only in that case he cannot be indemnified but otherwise in all other cases he has a right to be indemnified let's see the example mr b at the request of mr a sells goods in the possession of mr a but mr a had no right to dispose of mr b does not know this and hand over the proceeds of the sales to mr a afterwards mr c true owner of the goods sues mr b and recovers the value of goods and costs mr a is liable to indemnify mr b for what he was compelled to pay to mr c and from mr b's own expenses right of indemnity does not extend also to the criminal acts even though those criminal acts were authorized by the principal to the agent let's see the example mr a employs mr b to beat mr c which is totally a criminal act and agrees to indemnify him against all the consequences of the act mr b there upon beats mr c and has to pay damages to mr c but because it was a criminal act 
now Mr. A is not liable to indemnify Mr. B for the damages uh, he, what he had paid to Mr. C. Next right of the agent is the right to compensation according to section 225. Principal is liable to make compensation to the agent for any loss for any injury caused to the agent because of the neglect or want of skill of the principal. See the example, Mr. A employs Mr. B as bricklayer in building a house and puts up the scaffolding himself. The scaffolding is unskillfully put up and Mr. B is in the consequence hurt. Now, Mr. A is liable to make compensation to Mr. B. These were the rights of an agent. Now, there are some liabilities of the agent to the third parties also. Means, he has some uh, responsibilities for the principal as well as to the third parties. Let's see what are the agent's liabilities to the third parties. First is only a principal can sue and can be held liable for the acts done by the agent except where there is a contract to contrary. What is the meaning of contract to contrary? Section 230 defines that an agent cannot personally enforce the contract entered into him on behalf of his principal, nor is he personally bound by them. Let's see the example. The principal sent goods through the railway to his agent. The railway didn't deliver the good to the agent. The agent cannot sue the railway as the railway received confers no ownership on him. The principal alone can sue the railway as a consigner owner. An agent cannot be personally sued except in following cases. Means the third parties can sue only to the principal not to the agent. But in all these cases an agent can be sued. One, where the agent acts for a foreign principal. The principal is not available in the resident area and the, the merchant resident, uh, residing abroad buys the goods and here he's, uh, he has sent the goods to the agent to sell it to the different sellers. And there is no contract between uh, the principal and the parties here. That means there is a valid contract between the agent and the third parties. So, in this case, the third parties would be suing to the agent only. Second is where the agent acts for an undisclosed principal. Where the principal is undisclosed to the third parties, the third parties are not known about the actual principal. In that case, the third parties would only sue to the agent. Third point is when agent acts for a disclosed principal who cannot be sued. If there is some principal, the principal is disclosed to the third parties, but there are some conditions that, that, that this principal cannot be sued by the third parties, then the only remedy available with the third parties is the agent. They will sue to the agent for their uh, expenses or for their damages. Next is where agent's authority is coupled with interest. Where an agent himself has interest in the agency, then he contracts in his own name. And when the transactions are being done in the agent's name, then in that case, in all those cases, an agent can be sued. Where an agent receives or pays money by mistake or fraud. Where an agent has received some money or have paid some money by mistake or by fraud to the third party. So, in all those cases, third parties will sue to the agent only. Next is where the agent signs the negotiable instrument in his own name. When the agent is signing the negotiable instruments with his own name, generally it is a law of the agency that the agent cannot make any kind of transaction at his own name or can sign any negotiable instrument at his own name without the knowledge of the principal. But if the agent do this, then the third parties has the right to sue to the agent. Next, where the agent exceeds his authority means when he works uh, by exceeding the if exceeding his authority given by the principal, then in that case, agent can be sued. 
let's see where when agent holds out that he as he has an implied authority from the principal the third party can hold the agent personally liable for lack of any authority next is where the contract expressly provides where there is a is a expressly mentioned in the contract that in case of any default in case of any problem the agent would be sued instead of principal in all those cases third parties can sue the agent where an agent acts for a non existing principal let's see the example no agent can bind a principal who was not in existence at the time of the contract in the example a promoter who enters into a contract with the third person on behalf of a company to be yet formed is personally liable not the company would be liable in that case now when we have talked about the uh, duties and uh, rights of the agent let's talk about the rights of the principal first right of the principal is to ask for an account and also demand payment of secret profits earned by agent if during the course of agency agent has made some secret profits then the principal has right to demand all those secret profits as well as all the payments received by the agent for the agency next is to seek damages for disregard of the term of agency as also for one of skill and care that means where the principal uh, where the agent has disregarded the terms of agency and due to that if the principal has suffered some losses he can recover all those damages from the agent to resist the claims of the agent for commission and indemnity on the plea that the agent had acted for himself that is as a principal means if agent is claiming some commission or some claiming some damages uh, in that case the principal can stop him the principal can resist him when they when the agent has worked at his own name so these are the rights of the principal and now at last we are going to discuss the termination of the agency that means how the agency comes to an end how the agency is terminated so first under the termination is by agreement between the parties when there is an express agreement between both the parties means between a principal and agent then there would be the end of the agency it would be a termination of agency second is by revocation of authority by the principal if the principal has revocated the authority of the agent any time before it is executed that means it is a termination of agency this revocation may be express or this revocation may be implied with the conduct of the principal but the revocation by principal is subject to the following conditions one condition is where the authority has been partly exercised it cannot be revoked that means if uh, if the agent has worked proportionately on a particular uh, uh, transaction this cannot be revoked where the agency is for fixed time and the principal revokes the agency he is liable to pay compensation to the agent before revocation it is very important that reasonable notice must be given to the agent that principal is going to revocating the agency third way is by renunciation by the agent means if agent want to terminate it by tendering the resignation by ceasing to discharge his duties by mere abandonment of the services or by setting up any adverse title against the principal means if agent has done uh, anything out of these four the contract between principal and the agent of the agency will automatically terminate it next is by the completion of the business of agency once if the uh, agency was being made the contract of agency was done with some particular business with some target of some particular business as soon as the business is over the agency would be over let's say if the agency was to sell the property once the property is being sold the agency would be terminated and next is by death or insanity of the principal or agent means if any of the party of the contract of agency whether it's a principal or it's a agent uh, is dead 
or gets insane in both these cases it's not possible to sue the case it's not possible to create the legal relationships now so in absence of this the, the this would not remain a valid contract and this would give rise to the termination of the agency so this is the termination next point is by the lapse of the time if the agency is for a particular time period so that means after the lapse of that time period agency will automatically terminate it by the insolvency of the principal let's suppose principal got insolvent when the principal becomes insolvent he cannot be sued he is not uh, he he don't have the contractual capacity now and according to section 10 of the indian contract act 1872 an insolvent person cannot be a party to a contract hence the agency would be terminated by the destruction of the subject matter once the subject matter of the agency is being destructed agency would be automatically terminated by subsequent even rendering the agency unlawful initially the contract of agency was a lawful contract but subsequently with the passage of time something uh, something uh, happened which was out of control and now due to that uh, emergency due to that mishappening the contract has become unlawful so in that case it would be termination of agency see the example due to the declaration of war when the principal and agent have become the enemies between there is a war between two countries and now after the war the principal and agent have become the aligned enemies so in that case agency would become unlawful and it would be terminated last is by dissolution of a company once the company is being dissolved the agency would be automatically terminated so uh, in this chapter we have uh, gone with uh, these all these concepts we have uh, seen the meaning of agency how the agency uh, is being tested what are the various questions for that for determination of the agency we have read about the definition of the agent and the principal means who can be an agent who can be a principal next kinds of agent various kinds of the agents we have discussed how the creation of the agency is being done that is by express by implication by ratification etc next we have done with the agents duties to the principal agents duties to the third parties and what are the rights of an agent uh, against the principal and against the third parties then we have done with the uh, rights available with the principal and at last we have uh, studied the various modes through which an agency comes to an end so this is end of the lecture of contract of agency thank you